Okay, my name is Stuart Hazeldean and I'm Professor of Carbon Capture and Storage at the University of Edinburgh. Why don't you tell us about how the University and yourself got, got into uh, studying carbon capture and storage? Personally, I got interested in carbon capture and storage because I'd spent most of my professional life working with coal extraction and then with oil and gas extraction. And I discovered then that uh, the products of burning that carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere is having a really bad effect on uh, the atmosphere and on the ocean and on sea level rise. So clearly I th thought I can use those same skills into capturing that carbon dioxide and putting that deep below ground where it has no effect on humans. So we can carry on the, with the advantages of fossil fuel with much fewer environmental adverse effects. That the University of Edinburgh is the place in the world where carbon dioxide was first isolated and given a name. A professor of chemistry in the 1700s did that and we can go and see the original places where he did that in the centre of town. So the University of Edinburgh history with carbon dioxide discovery led us to try and see what we can do now to help clean up the products of carbon emissions. So in, we set up a, a grouping, small grouping initially of interested people in geology and geophysics and then that grew to include people from engineering and oil and gas uh, disciplines and that grew again for people in business, people in the social sciences, people in law because a lot of people want to try and do something to help about this and it is a very big and diverse problem and you need that chain of expertise all the way along to help solve the problem. So we've created a centre which is the biggest academic centre in the UK run out of the University of Edinburgh but collaborating with research work between Heriot Watt University, the British Geological Survey, University of Aberdeen, University of Glasgow and University of Strathclyde. We've got a cluster of expertise which is doing some frontier work in evaluating how to catch carbon dioxide and how to store that safely. What type of projects then are you evaluating? So that uh, runs across the whole spectrum right from how you design a power station to be compatible with carbon capture, what type of carbon capture you might fit on that power station, how you operate that to fit in with an electricity market in commercial sense, how you then liquefy that carbon dioxide and transport it either in a pipe or in a boat. And then my particular expertise is how you drill holes deep down underground and inject that carbon dioxide to be safely and securely stored for tens of thousands of years into the future. And to do all that, we also have to link across into the business side about who pays, how that turns a profit, and then with the regulators and with the government about how we make the law to permit that to happen and how we regulate that that is, continues to happen to good environmental standards. You had mentioned safety. I know that people are always concerned about safety. Uh, why don't you tell us how you determine that an area is, is a candidate for putting the uh, CO2 and how safe that is once you put it down there? The performance of the underground storage site is obviously something which a lot of people are concerned about. But I say as a geologist, professionally, we've got extremely good information to give high quality reassurance about that. And we know about that from three different methods. Firstly, we know that the oil and gas industry has investigated the underground since the middle 1800s. So we know how to drill holes, we know how to image the underground, we know how fluids behave under pressure underground. Secondly, we can go to places where there's natural carbon dioxide trapped in the earth naturally. Those places exist in the Colorado Plateau of the United States, for example, in Italy, in Europe, and underneath the North Sea in our own backyard here for the UK. And we can see that the carbon dioxide there has been trapped for many millions of years. So we've tried to search for natural places which mimic that natural containment. We want to find places where we can engineer that. And thirdly, there are places around the world where carbon dioxide has been injected indus at industrial scale, firstly with improved oil recovery since uh, the early 1970s, and then since the mid-1990s for the deliberate purpose of disposing of that CO2. And all of those projects have safely and securely retained the CO2 with no major accidents and no big leakage at all. What depths are you sealing this at? What is the optimum depth, let's say? The depth to inject carbon dioxide, uh, you'd look at uh, depths of below a kilometer, below about uh, 3,000 feet. And that's chosen because at that depth, the pressure of the overburden of the earth keeps the carbon dioxide as a liquid. Just like in a fire extinguisher, the carbon dioxide's under pressure and it's a liquid. And that means you can handle the carbon dioxide through a pipeline, inject that down a borehole, 
much, much more easily. And the improved oil recovery industry in the United States has been doing that for many decades, so they know exactly what they're doing. And uh, you can go as deep as four or even five kilometers uh, down to inject carbon dioxide. It just gets more expensive the deeper you go. I know uh, we're looking at a project in the States uh, on the Canadian-US border, the Boundary Dam project, sure. where they're looking at uh, injecting CO2 and then maybe releasing it again for commercial purposes. Are you involved in anything like that? Yeah, we've got good links with the Boundary Dam projects where we've been over there to see their project because clearly that's going to be one of the first in the world to fit carbon capture and storage on a commercially operating electricity power station. And uh, so what they're doing there is using part of their carbon dioxide to do improved oil recovery in the Weyburn and Mydale fields. And that uh, CO2 injection has been going on for many years in the Weyburn field. And we've done site surveys at the surface and there's absolutely no detectable CO2 leakage at all. So it's safely and securely stored whilst also bringing out additional oil, which pays for all the uh, capture and pipe work. The other aspect to the Boundary Dam project is a research project at a site called Aquistore where they've drilled two boreholes and we'll be injecting CO2 into those later on this year in late 2014 and we'll be part of the monitoring using the sound waves detected at the surface to monitor the cracks and the direction the CO2 travels underground and also monitoring the trace gases, the fingerprints of the trace gases in the carbon dioxide to tell if the carbon dioxide we detect as it moves from one well to another, is that the same carbon dioxide that we've injected? How fast does it move? And that knowledge helps us to predict the safety and security of site performance for the next hundreds of years into the future. Why, why should business and industry be interested in, in the research and then the practical use of this? Business it has to be interested in this because it's clear that in our industrialized society, we all use a lot of carbon and that flows through business and industry to generate electricity, or to make cement, or to make steel, or to make paper, or to make fertilizer for growing crops. So we all have a stake in that business and industry flow of carbon. So the business and industry have to be responsible for catching their carbon in just the same way that we ask business and industry to be responsible for cleaning up other waste products, whether that's uh, volumes of uh, metal waste, or chemical waste, or paper waste, or plastic waste. This is another waste we have now choosing to deal with, and that we're choosing to deal with that because that safeguards the planetary atmosphere and environment which we all live in. Why, why is it important for us to reduce these carbon emissions? Carbon emissions are important because they affect the way that the climate and the oceans work on the world. As a geologist, I can look back into geological time and we can very clearly see that there have been five periods in geological time over the past 600 million years where carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere has increased. In each of those periods, irrespective of the cause of the carbon dioxide increase, there's been an extinction of life on the Earth. And that extinction of life has affected between 10% of species and sometimes up to 90% of species. What we're doing now is exactly the same experiment with the Earth, but much, much faster. So there's no doubt at all about the outcome of the experiment. If we want to maintain the Earth habitable for humans, then we have to reduce our carbon emissions drastically. What do you say to the naysayers that there's no climate change, that uh, this is just a natural cycle? I say to the naysayers that they're choosing the evidence they want to believe. It's a big problem, it's an uncomfortable problem, you don't want to believe in this, but the evidence from science and technology is absolutely clear that this is an inevitable effect of burning and releasing all that fossil carbon. And the analogy I'd make is if you go to a physician in a hospital and the physician says, I want you to change your diet, you might go away and think, that's too tough, I don't want to change my diet. Ten years later, you come back and the physician says, I've told you to change your diet, you're heading back into worse territory still. You don't change your diet, ten years are further on and says, I really can't do anything for you now, you're going to need radical surgery. Where in that position in the earth? The science evidence is clear, it's repeated, it's repeated. Now's the time for the politicians to start taking action with business. I've heard dates where there's uh, no turning back, if you will. Do you have a date? Do you have a projected date where we've gone too far? The simplest way to understand the date is that we've got a finite amount of carbon we can burn. We're halfway through that amount of carbon. If we carry on behaving as we are, we get through that amount of carbon total by about the mid-2040s. 
doesn't matter if it's 2030s or 2040s, we're more than halfway through our carbon party. And so that's a finite budget. That's not the budget until the next budget period. That's the total carbon by mid-2040s. And after that, no carbon permitted until the next 10,000 years after that. So this is not normal economics. This is global resource economics we're dealing with. And that's why there's a market failure in this. The money system doesn't actually work because money doesn't price the value of the planet. If you could tell us what we can do to help India and China so they can reduce their carbon emissions. There's a contest between the developed nations and the less developed nations. Clearly the increase into the future of carbon emission is going to come from developing economies like India, like China, like Southeast Asia. I've been to visit some of those people in India and Southeast Asia. They don't have electricity yet. Three quarter, you know, a quarter of that population doesn't have electricity. They have the right to have electricity. So it's tough for us to ask them to clean up something where they haven't even got the minimum standards we regard as normal. So the move has to come from the older industrial nations, whether that's the United States, Europe, Australia. They can make the move to develop the technology, make that technology established, and then the developing nations like China will pick that up and make that much cheaper. But we have to make the first moves. Do we have that technology now? I think the technology exists and there's no obstacle to proceeding with this other than the will to proceed. So the capture equipment can be bought from six or eight international standard vendors globally with industrial guarantees, which means they're certain enough that it's going to work, that they'll sell it with that guarantee of performance. The pipelining can be done. We know that from the United States from the 1970s and onwards. And the storage can be done. We know that from the injection experiments and industrial scale projects which have been going on since the 1960s. And we know that again from the improved oil industry in the US since the 1970s. So the only thing which blocks that is the political starting gun and the way to make the money flow along that chain. You can make the money flow in two different ways. Either you set a standard of performance like the United States is planning to do, or you have a low carbon electricity price like Europe's trying to do. Europe is saying that we value low carbon electricity. The cheapest way to generate electricity is high carbon, to burn the coal and burn the gas and dump that emission into the atmosphere. If we value low carbon electricity, then we're going to pay you more for that low carbon electricity. And that extra payment will pay for the additional cost of capture, transport and storage. I say that's a sensible thing to do because we all have produced domestic rubbish the cheapest thing to do with our rubbish is throw it into the street or into the next door's backyard, but that doesn't actually get rid of it. So we pay extra money to have people to take our rubbish away, recycle a lot of that rubbish now, that's created a lot of extra business, and what we can't recycle we have to store in a landfill or some other site. So there's an analogy between how we want to behave and paying a little bit extra to behave properly. When you say recycle for um, CO2, are you talking about the, the commercial uses? So there's commercial uses for carbon dioxide, but we have to be cautious that that's, I think that's slightly overplayed in the sense that the volumes of carbon dioxide we produce from power and industry are immense. So yes, you can use some of that to make pharmaceuticals, you can use some of that carbon dioxide to make uh, fertilizers, but that's a huge volume of extra carbon dioxide. The largest volume use for carbon dioxide, which remains, can be used in underground oil recovery. So it's clear that you can inject huge tonnages of carbon dioxide, and in the United States you could produce billions of extra barrels of oil by doing that, by taking one person's waste product and making something valuable out of that. And we're doing research work here which shows that when we track the carbon through that chain, you can engineer that to store more carbon underground than you actually produce extra oil, so you can produce money and store carbon. But there has to be a regulator and a legislative government intervention to make that happen, because companies just left to themselves will use the minimum storage and the maximum oil production, so actually that produces more carbon. You have to be a bit careful. Are there a lot of sinks, are there a lot of places around the world where you can store carbon? So the carbon storage is obviously the critical thing because we can build any amount of carbon capture but there's no point in doing that unless we can store it safely and securely for at least 10,000 years into the future. So many industrial and developed countries have examined their own backyards and to assess the geology underground. 
for carbon storage. And the geology underground you need is actually quite simple. You need a porous and permeable rock like a sandstone, which forms an aquifer at the surface, but is salt water filled deeper down. And that has to have a lid on it, a lid of impermeable rock, a shale rock. Now that combination, that doublet, is pretty common worldwide. And it's especially common in areas where people have produced hydrocarbons in the past, so oil and gas provinces, and provinces where people produce coal also usually have that doublet of geology. So the world's been looked at in the appraisal level, and it's clear that we've got more than enough storage to capture all our emissions globally till about 2100. So we can carry on behaving like this and give ourselves time to develop lower carbon sources. We've got the time to do that, but we need to start. And so the starting places have been in places like the North Sea, have been in places like Decatur, Illinois, have been in places like uh, Cranfield in Mississippi, have been in places like Boundary Dam, Saskatchewan. Those are the starting seeds from which this huge industry should now be taking off. Could you uh, specifically say why all of this is important to the coal industry? So the coal industry needs to get interested in carbon capture and storage because coal is a very low cost fuel, it's very accessible. Many countries worldwide have a lot of coal domestically and use and mine and burn a lot of coal. But it's also clear that to produce one unit of electricity, coal produces the most carbon dioxide for one unit of electricity. Gas, by contrast, produces half the amount of carbon dioxide for that same unit. So coal, in both its volume of usage, its tonnage of usage, and in its amount of carbon dioxide is the obvious first target. So people with coal mining, coal extraction, coal burning power plant are the first candidates who have to fit that carbon dioxide to clean up their act. Otherwise, they'll be priced out of the market as cleaner gas takes that market away from them. So coal could disappear as an energy source? If coal fails to take action on collecting their carbon and cleaning up their carbon, they will be disappearing as an energy source. That's already been policy in the UK. Nobody's built a coal power station since the uh, 1970s. It's now effectively a policy in Europe. It's a policy from the international loan development banks who are not funding coal plant anymore. And with the moves from the Environment Protection Agency, I think we can see that's a developing policy in the United States. Good. So coal has to get serious about its cleanup. Are we able to uh, bite the bullet and, and stop using coal? Do you think that's, that's realistic? Stopping using coal is difficult because it's the lowest cost fuel. But that in fact is the purpose, part of the purpose of carbon capture and storage, that the world can carry on using a low cost fuel such as coal and add on a few percent only to the cost of using that fuel, but make that fuel environmentally clean enough that we can carry on using that for the next 40 or 50 years. Now that's not of course the end game because even that cleanup means that we still have to move further into lower and lower carbon. But that gives us time. It buys us time to develop new, even better methods of catching carbon and new, even better methods of generating zero carbon electricity. You and I as citizens, what can we do on the, on the lower level? What can we do? What can citizens do is really important because politicians react to what citizens think. Companies react to what citizens think. So as a citizen, you have purchasing power. So one of the simplest things you can do is ask your electricity provider that for low carbon electricity. And if people start asking for low carbon electricity, the business will provide low carbon electricity. As a consumer, you can also choose what you buy and how much you buy. We're all very addicted to buying lots and lots of stuff which we use and throw away. Try choosing to buy less stuff which lasts longer. Many people are interested in what happens when you put carbon dioxide underground. And we know pretty clearly what happens because we've been doing that for many, many decades. And it's using oil and gas hydrocarbon industry technology to drill a borehole. And that goes down to one or two kilometers. And that borehole then accesses into a porous layer of rock where we can know that there's already salt water in those pores, that microscopic pores between the sand grains. And we're pushing that carbon dioxide in and that displaces the water. That carbon dioxide flows into the porous rock and then needs to be retained initially by that lid of impermeable layer, that mudstone on the top. And gradually over a few tens of years or, and hundreds of years, that carbon dioxide dissolves in the water and makes salty, sparkling water. And that then can't come out. 
Second thing that happens is as the carbon dioxide moves through the water, it leaves behind the carbon dioxide small bubbles disconnected from each other in the microscopic pores of the rock. And that's rather like having a damp sponge. It's got water or carbon dioxide in this case in the sponge, but you can't get it out. It's safely and securely retained. And we know that works because we can go to natural places where there's carbon dioxide already there in Italy, in Europe, in the Colorado Plateau, Arizona, Utah, in the United States, and we can find and observe that carbon dioxide in exactly those circumstances. It's retained there for tens of thousands and even millions of years. What we're doing is trying to find places and engineer those places to store carbon dioxide from our power stations and our industrial products to put that deliberately underground to do that. Sounds like the university and yourself are quite extensive looking all over the globe for um, places where this will work. It's a global problem, so we go to look for places where we can get insight globally to how this works in nature and how this is working with different groups and businesses around the world starting up these, this new industry. And this is gradually starting to connect. So it's been, the development of carbon capture and storage has been slower than many people would like, but it's absolutely true that it is starting. There are power plant projects starting to come online now and as that happens, people believe what they see. As that happens, you can believe a power plant that's working, a power plant that's catching its carbon dioxide. That takes away all the barriers of all the naysayers. You can kick the tires, you can lift the hood, and you can build one just like that. When you inject carbon dioxide underground, some people are worried about how that carbon dioxide reacts chemically with the rock, because we know that if you put carbon dioxide into water, it makes a weak acid, carbonic acid. And that's why some limestone buildings, for example, corrode away with acid rain. It's the acid carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I think we can be very reassured about that uh, because we know from oil and gas fields and carbon dioxide injection into places like the Weyburn field in southern Canada, that carbon dioxide is injected into a limestone bearing formation. It's not dissolved the rock wholesale, the land has not collapsed. That carbon dioxide sure reacts with a little bit of the rock, but there's so much rock there and so little carbon dioxide that the rock is safe and secure and strong. So when you inject carbon dioxide underground, people are understandably going to say, well, how do you know where it is? Well, the answer to that again can come from the oil and gas industry because we can do two or three types of thing here. Firstly, you can borrow technology from the oil and gas industry and just install a pressure meter down underground, which monitors the pressure of the water and the carbon dioxide underground. And you can compare the pressure you measure with the pressure you think should be there. If the pressure's right, you're happy. If the pressure's too low, then the carbon dioxide's leaked off somewhere. So you go in and do a bit more detailed investigation. Another way of monitoring carbon dioxide is to use seismic reflection technology from the oil and gas industry, where from the surface you can bounce sound waves down off layers of rock underground and image the rock underground. And you can also detect where the fluids are. Carbon dioxide is less dense than water, so it has a different reflection. We can tell exactly where that carbon dioxide is, down to the last few thousand tons of carbon dioxide by using that technology. And third, you can also use satellite technology to monitor where carbon dioxide is because we spin satellites around the earth all the time and in Algeria there's a carbon dioxide project been achieved uh, which unexpectedly inflated the land surface by about a centimetre. Nobody living there can tell anything that's happening at all but with the satellite you can tell exactly where that carbon dioxide is because you detect that microscopic ground movement. So there's multiple ways we can assess exactly where the carbon dioxide is and monitor that and tell that is performing safely and securely as we predicted. So when you burn coal in a power station, you're burning that usually in atmospheric air. Now clearly, atmospheric air has about 20% oxygen and about 70% nitrogen. So to be efficient on this, what we need to do is separate the carbon dioxide out from the rest of the nitrogen. So we don't want to put all that nitrogen from the atmosphere underground. So that's why you need the separation step, which is expensive but it makes the transport and injection of carbon dioxide much, much more efficient. And so what we're dealing with is trying to deal with is pure carbon dioxide. And pure means 90% pure, 95% pure, because you could do it to 99% pure if you wanted, but it's more expensive to make it really, really clean, because Coca-Cola used really, really pure carbon dioxide, but we don't need to put Coca-Cola carbon dioxide on the ground. So 90, 95% is good enough. Carbon dioxide emissions, are a global problem. 
what happens anywhere in the world affects the, everybody else in the world because we all share the same atmosphere. And President Kennedy said that in 1962, and it's still right, we all share the same atmosphere. And what I want you to imagine is that we have no real vision of the atmosphere, it's just out there. But if we liquefied the atmosphere and turned it into a liquid, the atmosphere would be about 30 feet thick of liquid around the Earth. And what we're doing is putting all our emissions, all our waste gases from power stations and industry into that small amount of liquid. And that's not a sensible thing to do. If you go to countries in, other, in some parts of the world, in Southeast Asia, you can't see to the other side of the city from the smog. So there's an air quality issue, there's a carbon dioxide greenhouse gas issue, and those effects also are helping to warm the ocean. Sea level is rising, so all the coastal ports are threatened from that sea level rise. And on top of that, if it's not bad enough already, if the world warms up, then you also lose reliability of seasons for agriculture, and you also start melting ice caps and extra ice, and that increases the rate of sea level rise. So there are, we should all be seriously interested in this. So have we reached a tipping point? Well, we're already in a not good situation. So we've already emitted a lot of carbon dioxide. We're about halfway through our budget of carbon dioxide. If we carry on behaving exactly like we do now, the world is looking not just at a two degree temperature rise by the end of 2100, but probably a four degree temperature rise on average, and I think quite likely an eight degree temperature rise on average. And on average means that some parts of the world are more than average. So some parts of the world will be looking at 10 or 15 degrees temperature rise. This is a serious problem. It's often not understood by the public that there's been lots and lots of experiments done with carbon dioxide injection in the United States, in Canada, in China, and within Europe. This is a worldwide science base we've got. And all of those experiments add different pieces into the jigsaw, but that gives us great confidence now that we can do carbon dioxide capture, transport and storage safely and securely. And that's why we're starting to see the commercial projects develop. Business and industry now have confidence that they can not get burned by this, they can make money out of this, they can have a commercial advantage by being the best quality of uh, industry and the best quality of electricity producer.